Huge amounts of businesses don't exist any longer. There is a massive insolvency event that happened, but it was papered over by governments and the central bank. And rightly so, really. I mean, what were they going to do? But they massively printed money. And what it's done is it's starting to exacerbate, not starting to exacerbate, it's accelerating the divide between rich and poor, which is the other truth that nobody wants to tell is what's going on. People know they're getting screwed. They don't know why. The rise of politics has come onto this. The actual answer is people's wages haven't gone up in 40 years in real terms. And that is because we had the largest generation in history, the baby boomers, all come into the workforce at the same time. Then we had the rise of technology. So they're now competing because, you know, they used to be typists. And then everyone starts using a computer and, you know, you start replacing people out of the workforce. Then by come 1996, the WTO agreement and globalization. So now you're competing against technology and you're competing against other countries. Then in about 1987, so wind back 10 years, all of these people decided to have kids, the millennials. Wind forward to 2010, the millennials and their parents are in the labor force at the same time, competing against Chinese and Indian and Vietnamese and Turkish workers and against technology. Right, everybody is screwed. So what did they all do? Well, if they weren't getting wealthy, they borrowed money mm -hmm. and the rise of the debt bubble. Meanwhile, the price of assets kept going up. So it meant that as a, a 32 year old baby boomer back in 1980, they could afford to buy a lot, a big house pretty quickly. They could buy a reasonable amount of the stock market. Don't forget the PE ratio was seven. Mm -hmm. Bond yields were 16%. So they, 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 they couldn't help but make money. Then cut to now or cut to January 2020. The 32-year-old millennial has the most expensive house prices in history, the most expensive stock market in history, the most expensive bond market in history, faced with no opportunity and debt, coming out of university with debt. And then the world blows up. Now, what was interesting is actually the answer started to come out of that, the world blowing up. Um, and that's as we start moving into a new era. So it is becoming... It's interesting that out of the worst adversity, the biggest recession of all economic history, as the system is essentially broken and is now being papered over just by central bank money, that new opportunities have arisen. I realized what had happened in Spain and I'm like, you know what, somebody needs to start the world's safest bank. And that's a bank that would have no leverage, no rehypothecation. If you deposited money, it would put it straight with treasuries, with the Federal Reserve. So I started looking at this system because I knew a lot of family offices and institutions needed this because everyone was terrified of the banking system and rightly so. And I went around the world trying to set this up and you know, we looked at a trust bank in Texas, something a trust bank in Singapore, we looked at something in Switzerland. It's hard work to set up a bank. Um, and then we had a global macro investor, my research business roundtable in Spain. And uh, uh, one of my members, subscribers, whose old friend, Emil Woods, was there and he said, another ex Goldman guy, another ex hedge fund guy, he's like, you thought about Bitcoin? And I had looked at it. This was 2013, early 2013. Maybe it was 2012, not sure. So I started doing more work into it and realized that Bitcoin could be an answer to a lot of this. This whole blockchain technology means that things like rehypothecation and those reuse of assets could be recorded. So we know who owns what, which is a big problem in the financial system. Uh, maybe we didn't need banks, maybe we didn't need to trust governments with what they do to the value of money. So I'm like, okay, this is really interesting. So I, I kind of started putting some thoughts around it and wrote an article for Global Macro Investor, which was the first kind of basis of a stock to flow model. I said, well, well if it is digital gold, because that's what it was being called at the time, then let's look at the above ground supply of gold out of the total known amount of gold, and then back that into the same numbers we know for Bitcoin. And I said, with gold at 1300, Bitcoin's worth about a million dollars. Um, and that Bitcoin at the time was 200. <laughs> so people were like, 
this guy's an idiot, but <laughs> it also got circulated around Silicon Valley very fast. People are like, oh my God, there's a macro framework for this thing. So I think I was probably the first person to build a macro framework. And I invested and it went up 100% a month. So I sold it and was like, oh, okay. You sold That's all interesting. of it. Because um, you're not used to assets going up 100% a month. Options you sold all of it? Yeah. Oh my God. I'd like, I made, I made 100%. It was great. <laughs> and then I followed the market and then I probably rebought back in about 2015. Um, and then I eventually sold out for 10 times my money way too early because I would have made 100 times my money if I'd held on a bit longer um, because I got very confused about what was going on with the forks when people were trying to take, create different versions of Bitcoin. I'm like, I don't understand this. And at the time, nobody did. Nobody knew whether it was going to survive or not. And I'm like, well, I don't really understand. So I will take my money off the table. Um, and I was happy with that. And then Bitcoin shot up and then... Um, I sp spoke at the um, the big consensus, I think it was the consensus event or the Coindesk event, whatever it was the biggest crypto event. And I got up on stage in mid-December and I had to give the Bitcoin bear speech, even though I'd been a bull. And I, I think I nailed the top within two days at that event, even though I'd sold out my Bitcoin a lot earlier than that. People were like angry with me on stage, like this is stupid, it's ridiculous. And then, you know, Bitcoin then suffered a tremendous bear market. And then I bought in again in 2019. So if we go back to this narrative that I've been telling you, the global financial system is broken. People are not able to participate. The only answer the central banks have for this mess, oh, so everybody takes on more debt. The only way the, the central banks have to try and keep this ship going and not sinking is printing more money, which is making the situation worse. And we're trapped in this endless loop. And it was very clear to me that the next recession, there's these two paths of the macro world and the crypto world, call it one new financial universe and the old financial universe are gonna meet at the horizon point, which is the recession. That was absolutely clear. And I made it clear through the whole history of Real Vision from 2014 that this is gonna happen. So then the moment happens when it's a pandemic as well. So like, this is the worst case, right? This is gonna cost everybody gazillions and Bitcoin collapsed as everything collapsed. And I'm like, this is the opportunity because the only outcome is gigantic printing of money. And that is the, and Bitcoin with its scarce supply and its answer for the future financial system, this is its time. So I went all in and I shouted from the rooftops in as many places as I could to say, this is your opportunity. Here's your life raft to get out of this mess. Um, and uh, luckily it proved to be the right thing. And now really what is happening is a parallel financial system that's even more than a financial system, it's the new digital architecture of the world is being built. There's a new promised land and people are migrating across at unbelievable speed. My All my old clients and friends from the macro world are now living in this new world. Virtually none of them are left in macro because the returns are so big, the opportunities, the ability to be optimistic and not pessimistic while keeping one eye on the kind of burning city of the old, which is the old financial system, but going into this new beautiful world. It's discovering of, a, of the Americas all over again. And it sounds hyperbolic, but it's not. I think it's gonna be the largest redistribution of wealth in all recorded history in the shortest period of time.